Hello and welcome to Taiwan Talks. I'm Ian Kavat. Can China be compelled to stop its harassment of the Philippine fishing community within Manila's waters? My guests today are Lai Yizong, president of Taiwan Think Tank, the Prospect Foundation. George Ian, research associate at Harvard Fairbanks Center for Chinese Studies. And Lucio Pitlo III, foreign policy and security analyst. Taiwan Fellow and Visiting Scholar at National Zhengzhou University. President Lai, George and Lucia, very warm welcome to the show today. A retired Philippine Supreme Court Justice has called on the Marcus administration to bring Chinese incursions in Manila's waters to the UN General Assembly in September. Four senators, including China Hawk, Risa Honteveras, are backing the move. They want to compel Beijing to recognize an international tribunal ruling in 2016, The Hague rejected China's sweeping claims to the South China Sea under what Beijing calls the Nine Dash Line. Beijing, however, never recognized the ruling. George, the Philippine senators want the United General Assembly, United Nations General Assembly, to make China behave. Can it? Uh, so first, it's an honor to be here. And second, uh, unfortunately, I think that's quite uh, challenging. Uh, but of course, uh, the UNGA, uh, as the audience might know, is different compared to the UN, Nation the UN Security Council, uh, in which China has a veto. So how the UNGA works is that a majority vote you know, would allow the passing of a resolution, if a resolution uh, does indeed you know, go to a vote. So, uh, uh, so first, in terms of compellence, uh, any resolution done by the UNGA does not, uh, if my memory serves me right, does not actually have any legal you know, status. It cannot you know, compel you know China uh, so the simple answer is no but of course there's a more complicated I think a uh, way of thinking about the situation which is that potentially bringing this issue to the UNGA could generate international uh, public opinions uh, focus you know on this specific uh, issue of Chinese encroachment on Filipino maritime territories mm. so although it couldn't compel China to change its uh, you know behavior directly and through legal means uh, it might be possible to generate some international public opinion pressure you mm. know, on China and how that might affect Chinese decision uh, you know, making and behavior, that's, uh, you know, you know, that's uh, you know, more complicated. Mm. Okay, so generally raising awareness and increasing yeah. pressure once again. Right. Uh, Lucio, uh, the new Philippine Secretary of Defense, uh, Gibo Tidoro, says that the uh, resolution or the move must be considered carefully, given careful consideration. Is this sort of diplomatic speak for no, the administration is not interested in making this move? Well, I, I would say that, uh, for one, uh, the government recognizes that uh, the United Nations uh, operates uh, in, in a different uh, context than in a domestic uh, context. And so, uh, of course, uh, one, the influence of China uh, among members of uh, UN General Assembly. Uh, so that, uh, I think, weighs heavily on uh, this uh, uh, hesitation uh, mm -hmm. on the part of the defense secretary. In, in that he thinks that it won't be effective? Uh, to m m maybe as a, as a resort that can be a button that can be uh, pushed maybe later down the road. Mm -hmm. But uh, I in the early, uh, because it's just beginning his stint as defense secretary, I think he would also at this stage uh, consider other options mm. for the time being mm. and maybe uh, look at this option somewhere uh, along along uh, maybe F later further later down on. the line yeah yeah um, president Lai um, one of the things that Tidoro says is that you know the since the UN Security Council could veto the move so can we explain you know how the UN General Assembly works and when it would possibly go to UN Security Council I think generally, <coughs> when it goes to National Security Council, basically that has to be a, ex a more extraordinary affairs uh, that has a direct security or the military implications, mm. uh, so that the uh, um, uh, the uh, resolution regarding how to react uh, to such actions uh, through the uh, military authorized by the United Nations that's necessary. So that's why the um, uh, not every actions uh, uh, of the United uh, UNGA resolutions will automatically uh, have a follow up option, uh, actions uh, through the uh, uh, Security Council. And also, and just like George said earlier, the uh, UNGA um, could uh, form a uh, majority opinion, try to uh, increase the uh, uh, public pressure on China. 
but uh, this time that uh, we also need to recognize that China has an, a very strong influence in the so-called mm -hmm. G77, uh, the alliance and states uh, within the uh, uh, developing countries. Mm -hmm. And so that uh, any uh, motions uh, trying to raise, especially against China, uh, the uh, it's, it is also possible that uh, it possibly won't be able to pass the majority, uh, even the UAGA. So mm. it's a very uh, uphill battle. Mm. Okay, I see. So China's influence is extensive, and they might not even get the, the, the numbers for the majority. Um, Lucio, so recently, uh, Ferdinand Marcos Jr., uh, Philippine president, said that there has been progress on Chinese fishing bans. Uh, what do you make of, of the progress that he says has been made? A Chinese fishing ban. Yeah, yeah. So um, let me just tell our audience that um, for decades the Chinese have um, uh, had these bans on fishing in two out of the, the 12 uh, Philippine uh, fishing zones. And they have, uh, you know, banned this between the months of May and August. Uh, and this is one of the things that's really restricted the livelihoods, obviously, of of fisher people. So um, could you tell our audience what progress has been made that Marcus has spoken about? Well, uh, I think this is still a, a problem uh, between the Philippines and China. Actually, uh, this goes beyond the Philippines and China because uh, other countries that also fish uh, in the South China Sea, like Vietnam, uh, of course, uh, Taiwan. Uh, they're also they, affected by the bans. They also mm. they are also affected by these unilateral fishing bans. Mm. While we do not have uh, any qualms about, uh, of course, the need for closed and open fishing seasons to uh, allow uh, the natural replenishment of fishing stocks. Uh, what we are against is the use of marine environment card, you know, to try to uh, buttress or reinforce the sovereignty or mm. sovereign rights claims of mm. uh, other disputants. Mm. So in this case, um, we oppose this unilateral fishing ban, not so much because uh, of the environmental aspect, but more on, uh, of course, the potential acquiescence, you know, that mm. it may uh, carry. So I think uh, the Philippines would uh, consider, for instance, uh, a proposition along the lines of a, uh, a joint or a coordinated fishing ban in the South China Sea mm. among all littoral states. Right. And uh, I think that would be more palatable than mm. just, you know, one country using its size and in its enforcement capacity to display this kind of behavior. Yeah, we'll, we'll come on to basically some of the aggressions that the Chinese uh, use against uh, the Philippines and as you said, other, other nations to Vietnam. Um, let's briefly talk about um, President Lai. Uh, if the Philippines was to go down the UN General Assembly route, you know, what risks would that bring? Um, what impact would that bring on relations between the Philippines and China that perhaps Marcus wants to avoid? So I think the, uh, 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 right now the issue is uh, the most fundamentally is about uh, Chinese uh, um, unilateral action and the violation uh, of the international treaties uh, in which he also signed and then the, uh, how to do it how to do about it? Mm. Uh, are we able to have uh, the uh, uh, the uh, necessary ca uh, capability and capacity mm. uh, to address these issues? And also, this is not just the Philippines; it's a, a mm. collective uh, problem for all uh, states uh, facing in the South China Sea. Yeah, as Lucio mentioned. Yeah. yeah. So mm -hmm. the uh, uh, I think the issue about how to get those uh, states that been affected all together uh, that's another mm. tall order, especially mm. like uh, Malaysia. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, Malaysia and also the uh, uh, Brunei. And uh, Brunei uh, is a country that uh, has a much closer relationship with China. And Malaysia sometimes on and off about uh, the, the things that the China, uh, China do and what they want to address. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, even within the, uh, the ASEAN uh, nations, uh, how to deal with China, there's also uh, the kind of discrepancy that uh, um, uh, in order to have the collective action towards China that uh, uh, we need to uh, really overcome those problems. Mm. Right, yes, it's interesting. So whether there can be co a collective, almost like a collective resolution perhaps, not just sort of single-handedly being the Philippines that raises this res resolution in the UN. Yeah, I think that's important. And the Philippines also uh, needs to get the whole ASEAN uh, mm. on, on its board, back. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. And then ASEAN, when we talk about ASEAN, talk about ASEAN then you have this, the uh, Cambodia. Mm -hmm. Cambodia is also almost like a Chinese vassal state right. within ASEAN. Mm. So the, uh, the, to a certain extent, it's like uh, the, um, uh, uh, the 
<coughs> the Hungary uh, in the uh, European Union. Yeah. The, or so Belarus for, for, for Russia, right? Yeah, Almost. to a certain extent. Yeah. So <laughs> the, uh, uh, it, it is a difficult uh, mm. problem to, to tackle. Okay, right. Well, now, the harassment of Philippine fishing vessels is usually carried out by China's Coast Guard or by what's come to be known as the Chinese Maritime Militia. Gregory Poling, director of the Southeast Asia Program and Asia Maritime Transparency Initiative at Center for Strategic and International Studies, explains this armed militia camouflages itself by operating on Chinese fishing boats. Let's take a look. So what you see is 95 Chinese boats. The heaviest day that we have monitored around this feature Every one of them are large, none of them broadcasting the signals that they should be to avoid collisions, none of them with nets or other gear in the water, none of them fishing. They just sit there for long periods of time monitoring and intimidating the Filipinos. It seems clear that China's goal in the South China Sea is to establish effective dominance of all the waters and airspace within what they call the Nine Dash Line. They don't want to do that by fighting a military conflict with the United States or anybody else. What they want to do is use civilian actors, these paramilitary forces, to effectively control the space, make it impossible for their neighbors to operate, and therefore win without ever having to fight. That was Gregory Poling of the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Now, another Chinese development is the increasing use of its Coast Guard for the kind of sovereign power projection reserved for a navy. To find out more, my next guest is Mark Montgomery, a senior director at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. Mark served 32 years in the U.S. Navy as a nuclear-trained surface warfare officer, retiring as a rear admiral in 2017. Watch this. What usually distinguishes a country's navy from its Coast Guard? It's the mission sets. The Coast Guard is fairly specifically about things like port security, uh, the security on the coastline, the, um, the maintenance of maritime aids like buoys, um, um, maritime safety for, their, for citizens as they kind of go out into the water, uh, search and rescue for when the citizens go too far out in the water. Um, and then you kind of look at things like immigration and policing, the law enforcement, for illegal uh, weapons or drugs coming into your country. And, and you can extend out into your exclusive economic zone when you're thinking about illegal fishing or um, illegal dumping of, uh, of hazardous material by a, a third party. Um, so it's those kind of missions. The, the navies have a much different mission. The mission is about power projection, sea control, and maritime security. Sometimes that maritime security is the one that, that kind of borders on both the Navy and the Coast Guard. Uh, there has been a change underway with China's Coast Guard. Uh, what is it that is causing concern? Well, there's two impacts to it. One is its size, and the second is the missions it's being assigned. So in regard to its size, you know, they, they have like almost 140, you know, greater than, greater than 1,000 ton Corvettes. That's, that's, you know, more than double the United States, you know, who has a much broad, longer coastline uh, than, than China. We have about 60 of those. Um, so they've built this very large, and, and some of their Coast Guard vessels are 12,000 tons. I mean, these are bigger than any Navy cruiser or destroyer in either the Chinese or U.S. navies. So they've built a very um, outsized capacity for a normal mission set for a, for a country with the, the maritime uh, border that, that China has. And, and it's the use of that of that Coast Guard. That Coast Guard has been out there kind of enforcing territorial or sovereignty claims at great distances, you know, from their from their ports and claims that aren't supported by the International Tribunal of the Law of the Sea. Claims in the South China Sea with the Philippines and with Vietnam, claims in the Senkaku Islands um, uh, with, uh, with uh, Japan. Um, is there also an issue about uh, the, the militarization of it? So the attaching of weapons to these vessels? Yeah, that's a great point. You know, many of these vessels are former Navy Corvettes. So they, uh, as they transition, they left the 76 millimeter guns on. When they build them from scratch, their Coast Guard vessels all have 76 millimeter guns. They almost all have flats or areas for easy, pl easy placement of anti-ship cruise missiles. And in the case of the Corvettes, they used to be there. Um, so clearly, they've the, these are militarized and even more militarizable um, uh, maritime craft. And so, uh, and look, while other navies also have some vessels with with with, uh, with weapons on them, uh, for, for the Chinese Coast Guard, it's ubiquitous. 
and it's generally larger and more uh, than you see in, in other Coast Guard. But would you say that the Chinese development or evolution is actually triggering uh, a so-called arms race where, you know, the other countries, they are militarizing their Coast Guards too because um, it's a reaction to China's encroachment? You're exactly correct. They're both growing and militarizing the, their Coast Guards in the region. So you're seeing the Philippines, Vietnam, Japan, um, Indonesia, all these countries both grow and militarize their um, their Coast Guards. Although, again, they're much smaller. With the exception of the Japanese, they're all very small. And in the case of the Japanese, um, uh, they have a, the Japanese as an island have a very large area to patrol. And why doesn't China invest more in its Navy? Why is it you know, developing and, and growing and militarizing its Coast Guard. First of all, they are very aggressively growing their Navy. No one is growing a Navy faster than the Chinese are growing their Navy. And in fact, the Chinese Navy's growth each year is almost, uh, you know, is about half the size of the of the Royal Navy. So each year they build 50% of the Royal Navy year over year over year. Um, they're building at, you know, two or three times the rate of the United States. Um, so they are building their Navy very aggressively, but that's one of three uh, parts of the Chinese Communist Party's maritime uh, footprint. The second part's the Coast Guard, which we've mentioned, and the third part is the uh, maritime militia, which is a group of about a thousand fishing boats and, and purpose-built uh, boats uh, that are used, that are generally unarmed, but are used to like stick their nose into areas and then call for help from the Coast Guard uh, when they're confronted. Um, so it's across all three of these areas that the Chinese uh, uh, Communist Party is aggressively investing in its maritime footprint. Is it because, you know, uh, these doing it uh, this way, so the aggression through the Coast Guard means that it doesn't quite meet the threshold for escalation? From my perspective, uh, this is all, you know, the the... the uh, use of the Coast Guard and the maritime militia is about operating an area below the use of force in that gray zone where the United States won't respond. There's a great imbalance with the Chinese white fleet, which is what the Coast Guard ships are all painted white in, in almost all our navies, in almost all our Coast Guards. Um, and so they're, they're able to conduct a, a sustained gray zone operation below which the United States won't use its military force to to confront China and, and uh, terminate um the operation for fear of escalating into a military to military conflict. They're attempting to, um, you know, achieve, you know, through um, uh, iterative processes, some kind of advantage, you know, below the level, as I said, below the level of war, below the level which will respond with the use of force. At some point, your gray zone activity breaks the surface. And when it breaks the surface and there's a harsh response from the United States, it could be perceived as escalatory by the Chinese. But the, the reality was they just pushed too hard and too far. That was Mark Montgomery of the Foundation for Defense of Democracy speaking to me earlier from Washington. George, we heard that Mark Montgomery said that, let me quote, China's sustained gray zone operation below which the United States won't use its military force to confront China for fear of escalating into a military conflict. How effective has this strategy been for China? So this, um, you may say that this is a quite a smart uh, yet uh, dirty trick that China has been playing. Uh, salami tactic, you know, uh, you do something that's a little bit naughty, but just not naughty enough to, uh, you know, excuse the language, to really piss someone off, right? Um, most notably the U.S. So this works, I think, initially, you know, if you only do this once or twice. But if you do this repeatedly, this does generate uh, at least two problems, you know, for China. So first, it becomes a signal that the Chinese is indeed, uh, you know, hoping or at least has some intentions or desire to revise the status quo, you know, of the regional, you know, order. If you do it once or twice, people might think, ah, yes, you know, maybe mm. it's, you know, tweaking, you know, a few things, you know, on the... You know, you know, you know, on the margin. But if you mm. kept on doing it, it mm. does reveal, you know, or could, uh, you know, signal that you are uh, indeed, uh, you mm. know, quite ambitious. So, so what do you, what's your assessment that it seems to be clear that that is China's intention, given the number of times, given what Mark said was the iterative actions? Right. Mm. So on, on that note, I would say that uh, it does seem to be 
you know, the, you know, the case, right? Mm. But at the same time, uh, decision making in Beijing is so opaque that, like, frankly, I think it's very difficult for any of us to say, you know, with one hundred percent confidence that yes, you know, China's, you know, you know, you know, has this grand plan to revise mm. the entire, you know, regional order. But of course, people make that argument, mm. uh, but I would be a bit more cautious. And to a certain extent, we could also say that like, China is just being optimistic, right? If there's no pushback, then you know, why don't we do more, right? And th mm. th if there's pushback, why don't we do a little bit less? It's mm. a bit like the Soviet Union you know, mm. at times. Mm. Lucio, I'll let you comment. So, you know, going back to what Mark said, um, it's the fear on the side of, say, the US, fear to escalate since it's kind of below that level of, 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 of war. So far, w what we see is that uh, there's this uh, recognition of that uh, threshold of armed attack. Mm. So that is the high bar. So that means that uh, China will try to employ tactics below that mm. in order to avoid uh, you know, getting that yeah. tripwire, you mm -hmm. know, and activating, for instance, the Article 5 of the Mutual Defense Treaty between the Philippines and, uh, and the U.S. Mm. Which was recently reinforced. Yeah, yeah so, so um, I, I think this is where uh, more firmer commitments, you know, uh, coming from the U.S. and more from the Philippine side asking um, uh, the U.S. to come up with more vocal firm commitment on the coverage of the MDT, uh, the assets that are protected under the MDT that includes not only Philippine Navy but also Philippine Coast Guard assets. Mm. Uh, of course, we have incidents wherein uh, Philippine uh, government ships were harassed or mm. intimidated on the way to provide free supply to some of our outposts in the Spratlys and uh, also interference in the fishing activities of our people and also the oil and gas activities in our continental shelf. Mm. And so these kinds of activities are, you know, these disruptive uh, activities are below the threshold of armed attack. Mm. And so they do not activate uh, alliance commitments between the Philippines and the U.S. Mm. And so China, to some extent, have a freer hand, you know, to, to, to do these kinds of things without fear of potential reprisal. Mm. And uh, this is where I think both the Philippines and U.S. in recent years recognize, you know, this gray area, this gray zone, mm. and are trying to find ways to address this. So there, there is a, there does seem to be an, an advantage, or we could possibly say that China is taking advantage um, of, um, of this, um, you know, staying uh, in the gray zone uh, warfare tactic. So what, what can we do? What can the U.S. What can the Philippines do about this, having recognized that this is happening? The, the problem is that um, uh, what, how, what is the threshold that you can uh, update or, or lower the uh, uh, threshold from the military, uh, uh, the, when there's a military operation that you definitely need to respond uh, to a not so much of a military operation, but you could also respond. And uh, the United States also has a fear that uh, uh, it does not want to join into the conflict. I think the Philippines could uh, best to make use of how uh, by defining uh, what the Philippines believe to be the uh, gray zone operation and uh, uh, the kind of the threshold that uh, the alliance response is necessary, mm -hmm. uh, rather than let the United States to, to define it. Okay. Geopolitical analyst Justin Bakisal says China's militarization is causing a ripple effect through the region. This is the result in the Philippines. Let's take a look. So the Philippines this year actually introduced a four-part Coast Guard modernization law. So, and they, they are in seeking to increase, number one, the number of personnel. Right now, we have 30,000 Coast Guard personnel. They're looking to increase that. Secondly, increasing the number of assets. And then thirdly, developing rules of engagement for the Coast Guard on how to interdict uh, Chinese incursions in the, in the West Philippine Sea, South China Sea area. So it is driving a lot of concern in the region. And other, other Coast Guards in the region, whether it's Indonesia's or it's Japan's, all of our Coast Guards are concerned about China's increasing military footprint. But secondly, there has to be it has to be emphasized that China's Coast Guard is under its military chain of command. In the Philippines or other democracies, like in other democracies, the Coast Guard is actually a civilian agency. In the Philippines, it's under the Department of Transport. So right now there is a huge debate on whether we are appropriately responding to the Chinese Coast Guard and the Chinese maritime militia by just sending civilian assets. So that's something that the Marcos administration is now currently reviewing on whether eventually down the line we have to field naval assets eventually. That's a very important point raised there that, you know, for China, um, the Coast Guard comes under the 
uh, Defense Department, Ministry of Defense. So um, tell us more about this discussion that is underway in the Philippines, Lucia. Yeah, so there is really that uh, growing concern. So mm -hmm. not only China has the world's uh, largest navy right now, they also have possess the largest Coast Guard in terms of fleet size. And not only the capabilities and the number of ships, it's also the behavior and the conduct of these uh, vessels, mm -hmm. especially when they are out at sea, uh, especially in contested maritime spaces like the South China Sea. Mm -hmm. So the way they try to enforce the, the way they try to interrupt or disrupt um, maritime economic activities of uh, you know uh, other states within well within their own clause recognized maritime entitlements notably their exclusive economic zones so these are clear uh, the using coast guards you know to try to enforce uh, sovereignty and sovereign rights claims which were already invalidated by a 2016 mm. landmark ruling so uh, this is a cause of concern for countries like the Philippines and Vietnam mm. because of the huge power asymmetry between uh, China and the uh, other Southeast Asian uh, claimant states. And so, so, mm. so yeah. would that be seen as an escalation, though, say, uh, given what Justin said about fielding naval assets, so Navy warships to respond, would that be that escalation that Mark Montgomery spoke about? I, I remember back in 2012 when there was this incident in Scarborough Shoal and we filled it in uh, our largest Navy ship at the time. Um, and uh, the Chinese used that as a pretext as the Philippines militarizing what is, uh, what is supposed to be considered as a fishing dispute. And so we do not want to provide them another justification you know, to ramp up or mm. up the ante. So there so is the danger. Yeah, yeah. Uh, mm. on the South China Sea. So mm. uh, of course we are investing in modernizing our Coast Guard uh, as well as our Navy and Air Force. Uh, and of course we're trying to work with allies, uh, US and Japan. Uh, to try to update the alliance, recognize this gray zone challenge, and try to find ways to uh, respond to them. Mm. President Lai, um, can we talk about Taiwan's Coast Guard, or let's talk about how China's Coast Guard impacts on Taiwan? Oh, I think uh, we need to look at the way that China Chinese uh, def definition about Coast Guard evolved, especially from year two, uh, before the year 2013. In China, there are five agencies, and then uh, in year 2013, uh, there the uh, Chinese sort of the uh, uh, combine four of those five of them uh, into one single Coast Guard agencies. But it is in year 2018, China started to uh, uh, put the Coast Guard uh, no longer a part of police, but uh, uh, put it under the armed police uh, as and to be uh, under its command. But the armed police earlier already has been submitted uh, to the Central Military Commissions. Mm. So that uh, uh, by that extension, the uh, Coast Guard is part of armed police and part of the armed police earlier already been subjugated to the CMC. Mm. So that Coast Guard right now become a, another uh, the, the Navy of China. And mm. of course, China also sometimes called the Coast Guard as a second Navy. So that's how the, the so-called the uh, militarization of Coast Guard is all about. And uh, in Taiwan cases, although Taiwan hasn't uh, met uh, uh, the, the kind of aggressiveness uh, like Philippine or Japan face uh, from China, uh, but if you go to the uh, Kimo and Mazu, actually at night, you can s find out uh, there are uh, over 70, 80 boats, uh, fishing boats, uh, just surrounding the Kimoi and uh, some of the uh, uh, smaller islands uh, more in front line. Whether that's in Fujian or in Hainan Island, uh, those fishermen, they are living in a, a military-like compound mm. uh, in a barracks. Uh, only when the, uh, when, uh, the fishery seasons, they go out uh, as a fishermen, but uh, the operation uh, is all military-like. Mm -hmm. So that's why the United States uh, consider uh, those Chinese fishermen, uh, they are not uh, the civilians. They are also part of right. the Chinese uh, wow. Navy. So it's blurring and along those lines as yeah, well. And right. th when yeah. that um, actually applied to Taiwan, what we have encountered is that there are several cases in which uh, our Coast Guard agencies or our in law enforcement uh, people has been uh, their ship and the equipment or even themselves have been attacked mm -hmm. by uh, the fishermen. And sometimes the, uh, the equipment on asset has been rammed through mm. by the, uh, the Chinese uh, fishing boats. Wow. And those fishing boats, they are not just a tiny boats. Mm. Uh, it's uh, a very modernized uh, vessels. Right. Uh, so yeah. what we're talking about is actually militarization of the fishing mm. fleet as well, which is, would be like 
the, the full the full circle, I guess. So that is why that mm. the uh, w uh, there's a need that uh, uh, since uh, their behaving is no longer uh, like a uh, uh, ordinary in law enforcement agencies, uh, and the uh, an action by them, uh, there's a military uh, implications. Mm. So that's why our Coast Guard had been authorized that that they could in those circumstances uh, has a the lethal means. But the lethal means not about enforcing the law, it's about protecting themselves. Right, yeah, that happened in May, didn't it? Yeah, so there has been all of this reaction that we're seeing across the region, including Taiwan. Mm -hmm. uh, George, uh, the Philippine and U.S. Coast Guard w are working very closely together, especially in, in the last few months. Now, Taiwan and the U.S. also have a Coast Guard mm -hmm. working group. Um, that was set up in 2021. What do you think um, are the chances of Taiwan working, say, with the Philippines Coast Guard as well, not just with the US, but also, you know, f forging an alliance, the Coast Guards? Uh, so we're, we're not talking about, you know, the, right. the, the navies, not, right. not the military, but the Coast Guard. My sense is that, you know, this kind of cooperation between the Taiwanese Coast Guard and the Filipino Coast Guard, uh, this will be more difficult probably uh, from uh, the perspective of uh, Manila, you know, politically, because of course, you know, Manila is trying to play this delicate balancing game, you know, as we all know, yeah. you mm -hmm. know, uh, not taking sides, you mm -hmm. know, try to cultivate a uh, rela good relationship with China, the U.S., you know, and you know, Japan, you know, Taiwan. So everyone, you know, is our friend, but, and we have no enemy. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I think there's uh, will be some, you know, political considerations in sure. Manila, I think. So but perhaps a red line. Yeah, yeah, I think it's hard. Yeah. But that being said, I do see this kind of coastal guard uh, you know, collaboration, possible collaboration between Taiwan, you know, and the Philippines as almost like, you know, a salami tactic or gray zone, ta gray zone, uh, mm. you, know, you know, conflict. Of that, yeah, or diplomatic, mm. you know, diplomatically, right? Mm. You know, you do mm. something that's a little bit provocative, but not overly provocative. Mm. It's not open military, you know, mm. uh, cooperation. So I think, I think it actually makes a lot of sense. That's mm. a, not a bad idea, but mm. politically it could be difficult, I think, right. for Manila. Yeah, I don't know what Lucio yeah. thinks about that. Perhaps you can comment um, on that, and also about the um, the history. It was billed as a historic meeting between the U.S. and the Philippine um, head, the chiefs of the Coast Guards in Washington. Yeah. So, uh, of course, uh, in recent months, we, we see this uh, uptick in activities, uh, not only on the Navy side, but also increasingly on the Coast Guard. And uh, cooperation between uh, Coast Guards mm -hmm. of uh, neighboring countries is growing. What do you think is triggering that, Lucio? Of, of late, of the last couple of months? Is there something, or is it just simply the realization that they must do something, they must cooperate? Yeah, I, I, I think the uh, challenge posed by, you know, uh, gray zone or maritime militias that are backed by states. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, uh, the, the use of Coast Guards, you know, for, for activities that are not normally associated with Coast Guards, you know. So I, I think there's this growing recognition among the region that uh, there needs to be a, a more concerted uh, response. And so um, whether in terms of training, whether in terms of asset transfers, whether in terms of uh, potential combined maritime activities, we see, of course, recently Philippines, U.S. and Coast Guard uh, have uh, held these um, trilateral exercises off the South China Sea. And of course, the historic meeting between the uh, Philippine and U.S. Coast Guards uh, in U.S. And uh, this is historic in the sense that uh, traditionally, uh, U.S. assistance to, to the Philippines uh, security sector is largely funneled to the military, so Navy, Air Force, Army. But Coast Guard is uh, receiving less uh, attention. Uh, in fact, Japan is helping capacitate the Philippine Coast Guard more than the U.S. Mm. So the, the, the mm. this recent meeting uh, speaks volume of the renewed, uh, the increasing attention of the U.S. to provide support to this uh, branch, mm. recognizing that you know civilian um, and armed uh, force units like the Coast Guard uh, may be the front line. You know, uh, they are in the increasingly in the front line of this contested uh, sea escapes uh, in Southeast Asia. Mm. Now, from Coast Guards to diplomacy, shortly after the Philippines and the U.S. announced the opening up of four new defense sites to the U.S. military, China's envoy to the Philippines, Huang Xilian, made these remarks to a Manila forum in April this year. The Philippines is advised to unequivocally oppose Taiwan independence rather than stoking the fire by offering the U.S. access to the military bases near the Taiwan Strait if you care genuinely about the 150,000 overseas Filipino workers. 
to discuss these remarks and overseas Philippine workers in Taiwan. I spoke earlier to geopolitical analyst Justin Bacchisal from Manila. I began by asking him whether the remarks about not stoking the fire of Taiwan independence obscured Beijing's intent to take Taiwan and were an attempt to divert blame for an attack to the Philippines and Taiwan. Let's take it. Yes, definitely. There's definitely that angle. One primary reason was that they were there. China right now is concerned about a lot of the EDCA bases near Taiwan, which are in the northern part of the Philippines. So and there are these three are the military new, bases. Yeah. Yes, there are three new EDCA sites in the north of the Philippines, which are about 100 to 150 kilometers of Taiwan. And China is viewing those as essentially staging platforms by the Americans. But the Philippines has denied this has denied this, of course. It's really more for bolstering the overall security posture of our country. And those bases are within Philippine sovereign territory. So there, China has received a lot of pushback regarding that. Mm. Let's talk now about the um, overseas workers from the Philippines. What factors um, makes the Philippines one of the largest sources worldwide for migrant workers? So the Philippines actually has a long-standing labor export policy from the 1980s. Actually, it began from the father of the current president, Ferdin F Ferdinand Marcos Sr. So this began in the 1980s. It's a way of relieving the tensions uh, in the economy, trying to relieve some of that pressure. So a lot of the foreign workers in the Philippines, they send back remittances to the local economy, and that contributes to domestic consumption, to household savings, and so forth. The migrant workers are often called modern-day heroes. Can you explain that to us? Right. In the Philippines, a lot of the migrant workers basically work abroad until retirement, and then they go back to the Philippines. So that often entails that Filipino migrant workers don't get to see their family for most of the year. They only get to see their children once, twice a year, perhaps during the Christmas holidays. So it's really a tough job for these Filipinos to be in foreign lands, um, trying to sustain their families locally here in the Philippines. And of course, they do have a net positive effect on the Philippine national economy because they do strengthen our uh, foreign, foreign exchange reserves, for example. Looking forward into uh, 2050, there has been some reports talking about the Philippines because of the, the growth of the population of really climbing up that ladder in terms of um, becoming, I think it was the 18th largest economy. So uh, what sort of changes do you think that increase in GDP would bring to things like uh, the migrant export industry? I think over time, the general trend is that the Philippines will have less of a migrant export policy. And the reason for that being is domestically, our economy right now is doing well. So by 2040, the Philippines is projected to become an upper middle income economy and we're hitting those targets. So this year, the Philippines is set to achieve nearly 7% economic growth and we're forecasted to continue that down the line. What that means for uh, for a lot of our, of our migrant workers abroad is that we're going to see a recomposition of migrant workers. So right now, a lot of countries uh, receive Filipino domestic helpers or nursing aides, for example. Whereas as the Philippines develops, we're going to transition, number one, not, not just less migrant workers volumes, but the nature of the employment also changes. And Taiwan is an interesting case here because Taiwan actually mostly employs manufacturing Filipino workers. So there are roughly 400% more manufacturing Filipino workers in Taiwan than there are domestic, domestic workers. So that's the difference between Taiwan, for example, and other countries like in Southeast Asia, because the Filipino workers in Taiwan, they are considered high-skilled labor, and they're cr critical to industries like semiconductors, elect uh, steel manufacturing, and so forth, which are also vital industries to Taiwan's national economy. What do you consider the treatment that Taiwan affords to the Filipino workers who help in these industries? Actually, the public sentiment toward Taiwan in the Philippines is very is very positive, mainly because Taiwan has progressive legislation when it comes to the protection of migrant workers' rights. So we have seen this in the past couple of years that that Taiwan has has really endeavored to, for example, try to rein in some of the manpower agencies that serve as brokers between foreign laborers and also local companies in Taiwan. So uh, there's very good government oversight over labor issues in Taiwan. But more importantly for me, at the strategic level, the selling point of Taiwan really is that it's a democracy. So there is rule of law, and we can expect that foreigners are treated in accordance with your constitutional processes. So we are less concerned, for example, about issues like arbitrary detention, even at, at periods of heightened diplomatic tensions. And so far, that's worked well for Taiwan. 
and we can say the same for example for other countries for example like China which has previously in 2016 2017 it did display that willingness to use economic coercion against Philippine trade products for example the cancellation of visas of some of our migrant workers they they have done that before so it's really an asymmetry of the political system that that matters President Lai, let me come to you. Off the back of Justin's interview, he spoke there about how the Philippine workers were, the overseas workers are a driver of the Philippine economy. But can we say that they're actually a key component of Taiwan's economy because of the numbers that are in the high tech, the semiconductor industry? Um, I think they are an important uh, component for Taiwan's overall, uh, including the social welfare and uh, by extension that also contribute to our economy. Mm. Um, <coughs> And I think the earlier the uh, the Chinese ambassador the uh, take uh, seems to take the uh, uh, the Philippine uh, workers in Taiwan as hostages mm. uh, for the Chinese uh, diplomatic uh, uh, blackmail mm. uh, against Philippines. Mm. Uh, but uh, there could be also some uh, real actions about it. For example, if the war really happens on, on Taiwan, usually uh, a war like this. Uh, the uh, f China will allow a so-called uh, humanitarian uh, corridor period, so that uh, you allow other country to evacuate uh, their citizens and or the residents in Taiwan to go back their country uh, for certain days. Uh, but by having the Philippine Filipino uh, workers in Taiwan as hostages, uh, there's a possibility that China probably would not permit the Philippines uh, try to uh, move back its uh, oh. citizens. So that was the underlying message. That There's could, a, that, that was could. The so the, uh, mm. uh, there's an operational aspect about it that, that we just cannot ignore. Mm. Uh, and going back to the, uh, the future Taiwan uh, economic development, I think the, uh, uh, when people talk about the semiconductor high tech, uh, there's a possibility that uh, the future development, uh, like in factory, that could be, uh, the, uh, we have see less human uh, due to the automation development. Uh, and uh, it is important that uh, the uh, Taiwan probably at that time will transform itself into something else, uh, not just about the uh, the technology, uh, but also part of the regional education centers mm -hmm. uh, that uh, uh, the, those countries uh, they would like to send their uh, students come time mm -hmm. to study, mm -hmm. and then Taiwan will present itself as a different uh, kind of the centers. Different, yeah. I mean, uh, Lucio, you you yourself are a. Um, uh, a researcher and you have come to National Zhengzhou University. Um, I assume that is part of the scheme between the two countries. Yeah, so uh, we, of course this demographic uh, shift, you know, uh, not only in Taiwan but also in mainland uh, Japan, South Korea, where uh, of course uh, Northeast Asian countries uh, the graying population and so the need for labor age uh, people and uh, of course Philippines and also other countries in Southeast Asia like Indonesia, Vietnam mm -hmm. uh, are more than ready to, to, to supply mm -hmm. and of course the semiconductor industry manufacturing sector in Taiwan very important mm -hmm. and so um, this uh, requires a lot of labor mm -hmm. and so uh, of course Taiwan would have to compete with, uh, with uh, South Korea or Japan mm -hmm. Or uh, maybe for the workers, you mean? Yeah, yeah uh, okay. <laughs> some future down the line to mm. to try to corner more uh, mm. of this labor, mm. to try to sustain this mm. very critical uh, global industry. Mm. You know. Absolutely. Um, now moving from Philippine migrants to Afghan refugees, the the U.S. Uh, through via Kamala Harris, the uh, United States uh, Vice President, has asked the Philippines to temporarily house 50,000 Afghans. How is this request being received in the Philippines? Well, th there were some who raised concerns about security because, uh, of course, uh, some of many of these, if not all of them, uh, if I'm not mistaken, all of them used to work with the U.S. Embassy uh, in Kabul or w work with the U.S. administration back then. And so uh, resettling them even temporarily in the Philippines, where uh, we, we have, uh, of course, a restive uh, tradition in the South. Uh, and of course, uh, some, some, uh, some of them have links with militants or fundamentalists. Uh, and so they, they may look at this, uh, this uh, Afghan uh, refugees that are temporarily being processed in the Philippines might become a target of uh, these kinds of uh, potential attacks. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, the Philippines also raised concern about uh, the way this whole deal wa wa was handled. Uh, I think uh, some legislators uh, uh, expressed that, uh, you know, um, 
they were informed uh, very late uh, on the stage, negotiations between both sides. Mm -hmm. And beyond the security risks, uh, the way the vetting process, you mm -hmm. know, if the Philippines will have uh, an input in terms of determining which among these 50,000 uh, the Philippines would admit. Mm. And I, I think these are, you know, make sure that the Philippine sovereignty will, will also be applied and uh, mm. the Philippines will have supervis supervisory oversight, you know, uh, uh, through, uh, throughout all the, the, the stage mm. while they are in the Philippines mm -hmm. and before they get admitted. Mm. Um, President Lai, would you like to comment on, you know, maybe some of the, if there's any pressure that might be felt by Manila because of this request, this very high level request. The United States is, uh, is uh, trying to house uh, those Afghan, uh, Afghan people who uh, once worked for the United, uh, was U.S. and right now uh, could uh, face prosecution uh, by the uh, Taliban government should they return to Afghan. And they wanted to uh, find some home uh, for them to stay, and especially in Asia. And mm -hmm. Philippines right now become the, uh, uh, the, the the, the question that they, they like to uh, the place a request. So, so why um, do they want Asia? Why do the U.S. want a home in Asia, Temp even if temporary? Yeah, the, in Asia, especially in Southeast Asia, uh, in Philippines, probably that has a closer relationship with the United States and also close to Indonesia, for example, and uh, Malaysia. Uh, and Malaysia, both countries they are predominantly the Islamic yeah. countries. Lucio, so what do we know about um, other U.S. allies in Asia being asked the same thing? Yeah, so, uh, so aside from the security risk, the uh, vetting process, uh, of course the Philippines would also inquire into whether uh, the U.S. also approached other U.S. allies in the region and wh whether the response was also affirmative and uh, whether there is any backlash, or whether there is any negotiation in terms of uh, the numbers that would be admitted and the, the duration of the time that they would stay, knowing that, you know, bureaucratic processes in the U.S. Uh, means that uh, it may take longer than what uh, was initially estimated. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I think these are concerns, uh, administrative uh, concerns from the Philippine side. But mm -hmm. of course, as these uh, people stay longer in the Philippines, the risks, uh, you know, the, the arguments against them, uh, the concerns and issues raised about hosting them, even temporarily, they would grow. Mm -hmm. So I think yeah. uh, it, it would also consider. be uh, <laughs> good, good to look at the experience, you know, mm -hmm how other countries help the U.S. address this uh, issue. Yeah, so it become a sort of like a shared, shared. A shared issue. Yeah. Yeah. Burden okay. sharing. Right. Yeah. Okay, well, we'll have to wrap that up now. President Lai, George and Lucio, thank you so much for joining Taiwan Talks today. Hello, I'm Ian Kavat of Taiwan Talks. If you liked our show, please search for us on YouTube. Give us a thumbs up and hit subscribe to our channel. Feel free to leave us any feedback in the comments section.